Okay, I would like to continue my analysis of Kate Chopin's The Awakening. Uh, once again, um, I am Dr. Weiss, and I am working out of the Heath Anthology of American Literature, Volume C, 7th edition. I am on page 1121 at the close of Chapter 15. As we continue to move through this text, there are more and more moments where uh, Edna has these uh, epiphanies. As I said in my last analysis, my last sequence of, of thoughts concerning the novel, that there are these epiphanic moments and then also these moments that uh, are kind of like a slow burn, uh, a slow progress to recognition, and then also these moments where um, you know, a sort of light bulb goes off, if you will. I want to point out the last paragraph of chapter 15. For the first time, she recognized anew the symptoms of infatuation, which she felt incipiently as a child, as a girl in her earliest teens, and later as a young woman. The recognition did not lessen the reality, the poignancy of the re uh, revelation, by any suggestion of promise of instability. The past was nothing to her, offered no lesson which she was willing to heed. The future was a mystery which she never attempted to penetrate. The present alone was significant, was hers, to torture her as it was doing then with the biting conviction that she had lost that which she had held, that she had been denied, that which her impassioned, newly awakened being demanded. Um, what I find interesting here is that, is that she sort of collapses in her understanding of her infatuation of Robert. And Robert, it has been announced that he's leaving for Mexico, and we later learn that he's leaving for Mexico, not because of the stated reason, which is there are um, economic opportunities in Mexico, but rather to get away from Edna because he is in love with her, and there's not a whole lot that he can do. Their situation uh, is really impossible. Edna here says that the past is not important, and uh, as casual lay people of psychology, we recognize that that is an error, that the past is important, that there are lessons to be learned to understand our current situation, our habits, our self-esteem, our identity. So, th but, but, but let me also say, but those are recognitions that are often very painful to face, and Edna says those are not important. Okay. The future is not important. She's just existing in the moment. Now, in one way, existing in the moment is a kind of carpe diem. It's a kind of Walt Whitmanian, have you pondered a thousand acres lately? Have you strove to get at the meaning of palms? It's like, don't worry about the past. Don't worry about the future. Let's live for the moment. In that way, living for the present, I would suggest, is very positive. Let's just live and be aware of living at the present moment, okay? At the same time, Edna moves from activity to activity as a kind of slave to her uh, impulses, a slave to her emotions. And in this way, I would suggest it is not very healthy to uh, ignore uh, the past and uh, to create an understanding of the context of one's behavior in the present moment. This also suggests that she's this infatuation, although she says the past is not important, the infatuation that she has towards Robert is similar to the kinds of infatuations that she had when she was younger, when she was a child. So it goes to the one, one of the many topics that I'm going to discuss later. Is this, is Edna a child that, or excuse me, is Edna a young woman who's stuck uh, with the psychology of a child, that this is a painful process of maturation? Does this suggest that being an adult, you cannot have love? Uh, you know, if you recall the, the image of the lovers all throughout this text. So what does this really mean? Is this a, a collapse of the present moment into the past in terms of love? Can people as adults have this very passionate sexual desire and, and whatnot that perhaps uh, one could have if they were younger. So those are questions that I think still linger and that are made cognizant in the text at that particular moment. Edna becomes more and more uncaring as to what 
other people think or say about her. Um, is this important? Does it matter what other people say and what other people think? I think it does matter to a large degree. Uh, to some degree, I mean, we're going to talk about how Edna is trapped in, in the social etiquette that she wants to free herself from. At the same time, there are things that are acceptable to do in certain company and things that are not acceptable. And perhaps as a sign, one of, I, I think there might be an argument here, certainly for mental illness, that she's just going at it and not caring about all the sorts of etiquettes and behaviors that are proper, or more as a sign that she is shedding the oppressive nature of the society that she's in, just in terms of uh, women's roles and patriarchy and things like that. There is an inner life here, and the inner life is different than the outer life. Is that is that reasonable? Yeah, I think it is reasonable. I think we all exist uh, we all have masks, if you will, in uh, certain contexts, that our inner life is just that, our inner life. And we cannot always act upon our inner life because we have other responsibilities. Freud might say that this is the sort of antagonistic or tension between the ego, the id, and even the superego, that there is a more impulsive, emotional, infantile self. That's one way of understanding the inner life or the inner life of, of dreams, the inner life of desire that cannot always be acted upon in one's outer life. On page 1122, at the, uh, at the bottom of the page, it did not strike her as in the least grotesque that she should be making of Robert the object of conversation and leading her husband to speak of him. The sentiment which she entertained for Robert in no way resembled that which she felt for her husband or had ever felt or ever expected to feel. She had all her life been accustomed to harbor thoughts and emotions which never voiced themselves. Okay, so we have difference between an inner, the inner life of an individual and an outer life. What is particular here, what is important here is that Edna is being a woman, she's never been able to voice her own self. So on one hand, I said that maybe the inner life, you know, there are hopes and dreams and desires that we cannot act upon because we have other responsibilities. On the other hand, I would say Edna as a woman has not had uh, the free reign of opportunity to speak in her own voice. On the top of page 1123, as this continues, they had never taken the form of struggles. They belonged to her and were her own and she entertained the conviction that she had a right to them and that they concerned no one but herself. Edna had once told uh, Madame Ratignol that she would never sacrifice herself for her children or for anyone, uh, then had followed a rather heated argument. The two women did not appear to understand each other or to be talking the same language. Edna tried to appease her friend. I think this, this moment is important uh, again for a couple of reasons. One, because it continues on with this uh, idea that Edna is not willing to give up herself for anybody, even for her children. And this is controversial, this is provocative. What is it that a woman is supposed to do traditionally? What is it that um, a mother is supposed to do? Give herself over entirely to her children. And that is what we've seen that Edna is not interested in doing. And here it is vocalized. The second thing is that Madame Ratignol is another woman. Now Ratignol is a sort of ideal housewife, an ideal mother, uh, does things that Edna does not do. But there is a there should be uh, a kind of sisterhood here. Well, let me tell you what is going on in my world as being a woman. You tell me what's going on in your world, and we can kind of commiserate. Rather, these two women do not understand one another. Ratignol does not understand Edna, and this further alienates and separates Edna from uh, her friends and uh, from her social circle. This leads Edna <clears throat> to let her husband and other people know that she is moving out of the house and she's going to take up residence about a block away to a house that's going to be called 
uh, a pigeon house, and often it is used in quotation marks. What I think is interesting about this is that the pigeon, if we're referring to the passenger pigeon, passenger pigeon, uh, pigeon is an animal that had become uh, or is soon to become extinct. And the pigeon is not this you know, great bird of prey. It's not a hawk. Um, it's just a, a kind of you know, lowly bird on the bird hierarchy, if you will. And that is how, uh, that is how um, Edna's house is being described here. It's not something great, just you know, sort of fitting in with uh, in the social hierarchy of society. But for Edna, that is perfectly fine with her. Actually, if I recall, it's going to be soon after the publication of this novel that the passenger pigeon becomes extinct, uh, right around World War uh, One. How does Mr. Pontellier react to this? Well, how would any husband uh, who I would argue loves his wife to the best of his ability in the uh, social context that he is existing in, how does he respond to Edna wanting to move out? Well, he's he's very angry. He's very upset. There continue to be moments of emotional outburst uh, when Edna is in her room on page 1127 towards the bottom of the page in a sweeping passion she seized a glass vase from the table and flung it upon the tiles of the hearth uh, we are continuing to see Edna express in various ways uh, often impulsively the pain that she is experiencing what we also see here, and I think I am in chapter 18, page 1128. Traditionally, we would associate things of nature with the feminine realm. Uh, traditionally, so you know, flowers and trees and beauty would be associated with women. Let me look at a portion here. Let us look together on page 1128. One, two, three, four paragraphs down. This is Edna, stood on the front veranda as he quitted the house and absently picked a few sprays of jasmine that grew upon the trellis nearby. She inhaled the odor. Now, this is her husband who had left. He uh, quitted the house. That's Mr. Pontellier. That grew upon the trellis nearby. She inhaled the odor of the blossoms and thrust them into the bosom of her white morning gown. Next paragraph. Let's skip down. Edna looked straight before her with a self-absorbed expression upon her face. She felt no interest in anything about her. The street, the children, the fruit vendor, the flowers growing there under her eyes were all part and parcel of an alien world which had suddenly become antagonistic. So it seems to make sense in many ways that we see Edna withdrawing from scenes of life, and the children, the street vendor, uh, her husband. But what I think is really important here is that a moment ago, Edna is standing and she, she grabs these uh, blossoms of jasmine and thrusts them into her bosom. And this is a very uh, feminine moment. This is a moment symbolic of desire. And then in the next paragraph, we see all of the things that Edna feels separated from. Included in that group are flowers. So Edna is withdrawing more and more into herself. How can Edna express herself? And we talked about this last time. Uh, she can express herself through her art. And she goes and visits um, Madame Rees, and I am on page 1137, and they have a conversation about um, uh, Robert. And Edna is very surprised to find out that Madame Rees has had some communication with Robert in Mexico and that the letters, uh, for the most part, concern Edna. Edna wants to see them. She, uh, Madame Rees, at first refuses and then eventually allows Edna to read the letters. But they have a conversation about art. At the top of page 1137, but you have told me nothing of yourself. What are you doing? Painting, laughed Edna. I am becoming an artist. Think of it. Ah, an artist. You have pretensions, Madame. Why pretensions? Do you think I could not become an artist? I do not know you well enough to say. I do not know your talent or your temperament. To be an artist includes much. One must possess many gifts, absolute gifts, 
which have not been acquired by, one own, by one's own effort. And moreover, to succeed, the artist must possess the courageous soul. What do you mean by the courageous soul? Courageous, ma foi, the brave soul, the soul that dares and defies. And so they're speaking about art, but they're also speaking to Edna's choice or her growing choice or her thinking about her independence if Edna has the courage and bravery to do, uh, to break away and to reinvent herself and, and acknowledge and embrace her new growing identity. The chapter ends with Edna reading the letter. Uh, it is full of tears, it is wet, and it is crumbled up on the ground. Okay, so in chapter 22, we get some insight, I think. The text here is laying out for us what it believes, the text believes, as a sort of common understanding about women. Mr. Pontellier stops uh, to his old friend, uh, the family doctor, Dr. Mandelay, and they have a conversation about Edna. Now, Mr. Pontellier goes and sees the doctor because, because why? He's concerned about his wife. He cares for his wife. I feel like part of part of what I have to do here is sort of defend Mr. Pontellier that there are uh, th th that there is a certain sincerity in the way that he feels for his wife. Is he part of the problem? Uh, sure, he's part of the problem. He's part of the patriarchal society that objectifies women. Uh, he is the husband in a relationship, and husbands have. Uh, a tremendous amount of power over their wives, so on and so forth. At the same time, Mr. Pontellier is concerned. He loves her in his own way, and he's going to go see the doctor. On page 1139, the doctor offers his friendly and professional viewpoint on Edna and I think in women in general. Um, one, two, three, four, five paragraphs on the bottom. Pontellier, said the doctor after a moment's reflection, let your wife alone for a while. Don't bother her and don't let her bother you. Woman, my dear friend, is a very peculiar and delicate organism. A sensitive and highly organized woman, such as I know Mrs. Pontellier to be, is especially peculiar. It would require an inspired psychologist to deal successfully with them. And when ordinary fellows like you and me attempt to cope with their idiosyncrasies, the result is bungling. Most women are moody and whimsical. This is some passing whim of your wife due to some cause or causes which you and I needn't try to fathom, but it will pass happily over. Okay, so again, I think Mr. Pontelli is sincerely is concerned about his wife. However, in part, he's getting a view of women by Dr. Mandalay, which is uh, pretty off. Uh, they don't understand what is wrong with Edna. <clears throat> they think uh, uh, that this is a passing fancy, that all women are moody and whimsical, which is, which is an overgeneralization at best and stereotyping objectification at worst. So clearly here, men do not have an understanding of women. I also think part of the problem here is even though Mr. Pontelli is trying to get some help from the doctor, that this is another example on how the body, how Edna as a woman is enmeshed in the patriarchal social structures within society. She is being discussed and analyzed by these two men, again, without any of Edna's voice. The doctor says it would be unfathomable to figure this thing out. Well, it wouldn't be unfathomable to figure this thing out. If one were to have a frank and honest conversation with Edna to at least begin a conversation of what is wrong, that would be good first steps to figuring this thing out. And uh, these two men, or at least in the doctor's estimation, uh, they say that women are so peculiar, particularly Edna, that women are peculiar and, and whimsical and unfathomable. Well, that's not because women are a mystery per se, it's because men don't have the desire to listen to what women have to say in their own voices. At the same time, we are given a glimpse 
of a little bit more recognition on the doctor's part, and certainly more of uh, uh, the doctor did not reveal all that he suspected. <clears throat> says at the end of this chapter, the doctor would have liked during the course of conversation to ask, is there any man in this case? And he did not ask that of Mr. Pontellier because of etiquette, that he felt because of etiquette, he didn't want to offend his friend, but the doctor does. So slowly, other people begin to recognize that the relationship between Robert and Edna Pontellier is becoming problematic. Uh, that Edna is becoming, you know, at best confused, at worst has fallen in love with another man. Even though Edna says the past is not important, we know again that the past is important. And in chapter 23, Edna's father comes to the city to visit, looking for a wedding present for his other daughter. It says here at the beginning of chapter 23, Edna's father was in the city and had been with him several days. She was not very warmly or deeply attached to him, but they had certain tastes in common and when together they were companionable. His coming was in the nature of a welcome disturbance. It seemed to furnish a new direction for her emotions. The relationship between Edna and her father, I think, is very telling in the way that Edna responds and thinks about men and how Edna's identity was formed as a young girl. In addition to that, I think there are possible moments that Edna as a young girl might have experienced as traumatic. This is uh, not something that would have been discussed, but Edna as a young woman, as a young adult now, you know, sort of re-experiences those earlier traumatic moments. It is telling, I think, that Edna is not interested in going to um, the wedding of her sister. I mean, this suggests that Edna wants to be completely separated from her past uh, in a way that I don't think is, is uh, very healthy here. Um, and it says on page 1144, the top of the page, you are too lenient, too lenient by far, Leonce, asserted the colonel. Authority, coercion is what is needed. Put your foot down good and hard, the only way to manage a wife. Take my word for it. This is not a good way to, to manage a wife. This is not a good way to manage a woman. This is not a good way to manage any relationship between a man and a woman, between a husband and a wife, between a man and a man, between a woman and a woman. To manage a relationship by force is not a relationship of equality. In the next paragraph here, the colonel was perhaps unaware that he had coerced his own wife into her grave. Mr. Pontellier had a vague suspicion of it when he thought it needless to mention at that day. So if one were to follow managing one's relationship or managing one's wife by force, the suggestion here is that the colonel was responsible for the death of his wife. Uh, I, I don't think she was murdered or, or that sort of thing but in terms of their relationship, wore her down, just as Edna gets worn down by the relationships and the way that she responds to her relationships in her own life. What this is also telling is the way with which Edna's father might have interacted with Edna as a child, if it was done by force, and we know that the relationship between a parent and a child is a sacred relationship, the relationship between a father and a daughter is a special relationship. And if the colonel was to manage the relationship with his daughter with force, this could be very hurtful in a variety of different ways that are now being manifested in Edna as she is now a young woman. Okay, as we close out this chapter, last two paragraphs of this chapter. Then Edna sat in the library after dinner and read Emerson until she grew sleepy. She realized that she had neglected her reading and determined to start anew upon a course of improving studies now that her time was completely her own to do with as she liked. The famous essay by the transcendentalist Ralph Waldo Emerson is Self-Reliance. 
not to rely on other people. And I'm going to have more to say about this a little bit later. This sense, uh, or excuse me, I should say the, the tradition or uh, transcendentalism in general, I think, uh, begins to become apparent, becomes apparent in this text, not only in the direct invocation of Emerson, but also in Henry David Thoreau's Walden in the chapter Where I Live and What I Live For. And there, I think, is a growing separation, all, all these different sort of separations, all these different deconstructions. And one of these separations or deconstructions, I would argue, is for not only Edna between, you know, herself and her family and herself and her society and herself and her husband and herself and her children, but between herself and modernity, between herself and the, the sort of totality of life that she is leading, if it is the life that she wanted to lead, if life is not just a big waste of time, is there a true life that we should be living to feel alive, to feel accomplished? And this is where I think Thoreau comes in. And right after um, the invocation of Emerson in chapter 25, second paragraph, on page 1145, on rainy or melancholy days, Edna went out and sought the society of the friends she had made at Grand Isle, or else she stayed indoors and nursed a mood with which she was becoming too familiar for her own comfort of peace. It was not despair. Well, maybe, maybe not. That's, again, you know, one of the arguments here uh, about mental illness. Uh, I think the sort of impulsivity and, and depressive tendencies, I think there's an argument for that, but let me continue. But it seemed to her as if life were passing by, leaving its promise broken and unfulfilled. Yet there were other days when she listened and was led on and deceived by fresh promises which her youth held out to her. And I'm going to have more to say about transcendentalism in a little bit. We are introduced uh, here shortly to Arabin. Uh, another young man in the social circles that uh, sort of circulate around. Now, he has a reputation of uh, getting together with, with uh, women or, you know, being a little bit shady or, or whatever the case may be. And in this chapter, <clears throat> in chapter 25, that I was just reading from, Edna and Arobin are out gambling. And why do I think this is important? because gambling is uh, an addiction. Uh, it can be an addiction. And Edna is uh, perhaps engaged, possibly, in some various addictive type of uh, behavior, self-destructive behaviors. In this case, gambling is giving her a kind of thrill that her regular life is not uh, able to give her. And this is all sort of caught up in this sort of pseudo-romance with this new suitor. We are told that Arobin, at the bottom of page 1149, that Arobin and her became intimate and friendly by imperceptible degrees and then by leaps. You know, why is it that Edna attaches herself to Robert and then to Arobin? And I think one of the reasons, uh, one of the reasons might be is that they listen to her. When Edna speaks, they listen to what she has to say. Now the question is, do they acknowledge what she has to say or are they there because of other reasons? I think in the case of Arabin, he's just interested in getting together and having sex with Edna. And I think that becomes a possibility here very shortly. At the end of chapter 27, Arobin and Edna are together in the last couple of paragraphs. I'm jealous of your thoughts tonight. They're making you a little kinder than usual, but some way I feel as if they were wandering, as if they were not here with me. She only looked at him and smiled. His eyes were very near. He leaned upon the lounge with an arm extended across her while the other hand rested upon her hair. They continued silently to look into each other's eyes when he leaned forward and kissed her. 
She clasped his head, holding his lips to hers. It was the first kiss of her life to which her nature had really responded. It was a flaming torch that kindled desire. Chapter ends. And then chapter 28 begins, Edna cried a little that night after Arabin left her. I would suggest to us that this is a, a moment where Arabin and Edna uh, become intimate. This is not explicit in the text. It is, uh, I think, implicit. Uh, we can surmise that this has happened. And Edna now has recognized something in herself that has been absent before, which I think is the recognition of herself as a sexual being. It was not the same sort of awakening, if you will, that she has felt with Robert at the bottom of the uh, paragraph. This is chapter 28, which is only one paragraph long. But among the conflicting sensations which assailed her, there was neither shame nor remorse. There was a dull pang of regret because it was not the kiss of love which had inflamed her, because it was not love which had held this cup of life to her lips. Was it acceptable? for a woman to desire to have sex. Um, no, I mean, people didn't really talk about that sort of thing. Uh, men desired to have sex. Women needed to be proper and responsible and maintain their honor and not be driven by animalistic emotions and desires. And then we are told, if we don't think, let's just say, if we don't think that they had sex at that particular moment, then when we get to the end of chapter 31 on page 1162, I think it becomes a little more explicit. Yes, she admitted it was stupid. No, it was delightful, but it has worn you out. His hand had strayed to her beautiful shoulders, and he could feel the response of her flesh to his touch. He seated himself beside her and kissed her lightly upon the shoulder. I thought you were going away, she said in an uneven voice. I am, after I have said good night. Good night, she murmured. He did not answer, except to continue to caress her. He did not say good night until she had become supple to his gentle, seductive entreaties. So Arabin may, may, uh, may have helped facilitate her sexual awakening, Robert may have helped facilitate her emotional, uh, her romantic uh, awakening in terms of, of love and passion. Okay, I want uh, to get us to chapter 34 on page 1171. Robert has come back from Mexico. She's very unhappy with Robert because he had been back a day or two days, a day and a half. The day before yesterday, he had arrived. He did not want to see her. He professes uh, shortly his love for Edna and the impossibility uh, that they can be together. Um, but when she comes back at the top of page 1171, excuse me, when he comes back, bottom of page 1170, she stayed alone in a kind of reverie, a, a sort of stupor. Step by step, she lived over every instant of the time she had been with Robert after he had entered Mademoiselle's uh, Reese's how, uh, door. She recalled his words, his looks, how few and meager they had been for her hungry heart. A vision, a transcendently seductive vision of a Mexican girl arose before her. She writhed with a jealous pang. She wondered when he would come back. He had not said he would come back. She had been with him, had heard his voice and touched his hand, but some way he had seemed near to her off there. Excuse me. But some way he had seemed nearer to her off there in Mexico. What does this mean? What does this suggest? Something has happened in Edna's understanding of her relationship with Robert. And this, I think, maybe is evidence towards the, the, the sort of mental illness argument or by circumstance, she's just become so withdrawn that she's beginning to experience a kind of flat affect, not able to uh, really feel things. Uh, she's not able to think clearly about things. What has happened with Robert? Robert has become a kind of fantasy. 
he's not even real anymore. There was this tension of their so-called courting before he went to Mexico. And while Robert was gone in Mexico, she fantasized about him. She fantasized about you know, how they used to be together and how she wants to be together and all of that sort of thing. He, he was made to be something not real. And now that he's returned, it's not like her dreams have now come true, that there now is a separation between the idea of Robert, perhaps that childhood fascination and infatuation with men, with certain men, and the reality of Robert coming back, which is there's really nothing for us here. So this is the sort of last possibility, one of the last possibilities, maybe the last possibility that could save Edna. She's moved into her own house. Uh, she has a kind of separation between her and other women, her and her children, her and the church, her and the doctor. Robert was the, the, the one person, the last chance that she had. And now to Edna, he's no longer real. On page 1174, Robert and Edna kiss. In the middle of the page, Robert, she said, are you asleep? No, he answered, looking up at her. She leaned over and kissed him. A soft, cool, delicate kiss whose voluptuous sting penetrated his whole being. Then she moved away from him. He followed and took her in his arms, just holding her close to him. She put her hand up to his face and pressed his cheek against her own. The action was full of love and tenderness. He sought her lips again. Then he drew her down upon the sofa beside him and held her hand in both of his. What is important in this moment? Well, first of all, I think it's a very beautifully written moment. Uh, it's a very romantic moment. Uh, if this is Edna and Robert's first kiss, all in the context, uh, you know, we can't push this too far away, but Edna, uh, you know, there's a, a morality argument that could be made that Edna is acting immoral because she is the wife of Mr. Pontellier. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, uh, we shouldn't push that, uh, too far aside here. Although, um, you know, that falls under the, the, the whole discussion and conversation about social institutions and marriage in general and what would happen if Edna desired a divorce and is that a possibility in, in, in terms of uh, legality and economics and the children and, and that sort of thing. So I think this is a romantic moment between two people outside of institutional parameters. What I think is most important here is that it is Edna that facilitates the kiss. Edna is acting on her own woman desire and making the first move. This would, uh, or I should say, this is, I think, transcendent of typical gender roles. Uh, and this is what Edna has been doing uh, for most of this text, exploring gender roles, trying to understand gender roles, but making her own way, being self-reliant, being non-conformist, to use uh, terms of the transcendentalists. <sighs> Again, as we begin to close out this text and all of these different avenues begin to, or have been closed off for Edna in terms of the, the possibility of recovering her, uh, saving her, whether metaphorically or physically, and we learn at the end of this text that Edna dies, Edna goes and visits uh, Madame Ratignol, and Madame Ratignol is sick and uh, desires the company of her friend. Uh, at the uh, end of chapter uh, 37, when Edna is leaving, she was still stunned and speechless with emotion when later she leaned over her friend to kiss her and softly say goodbye. Adele, pressing her cheek, whispered in an exhausted voice, Think of the children, Edna. Oh, think of the children. Remember them. Again, this is a moment that, you know, I think that has been building that other people in this text, Mr. Pontellier, the doctor, here, Madame Ratignol, they recognize that something is wrong 
whatever that wrong is and, and whatever its variation and its depth, something is wrong with Edna. And if we think about this text then as uh, Edna suffering from mental distress, uh, mental illness even, uh, there, uh, again, there's that argument that can be made. I, I think the argument is important. It's not the only argument, but I think the argument is important in the context of modernity, in the context of modernity in the late 19th and early 20th century, in the context of modernity today. What do we do? How do we think about those that are suffering from mental distress? The worst thing that we can do is nothing. And in many ways, this is what has occurred in this text. You have, you know, little bits of information, whether they're acted upon or somebody, you know, somebody says something directly to Edna, like, think of the children. Or the doctor who has some idea about Edna's situation, it would be his responsibility as a medical professional to sort of act upon his suspicions to help Edna. But this is the beginning of the age of Freud. And Freud, uh, among many other things, including the, the, the sort of discovery, if you will, of the unconscious, you know, this idea of the talking cure. And what should, be, what should people be doing? Talking to Edna, having Edna talk to them, acknowledging what Edna has to say. And so all of these different sort of ingredients into this soup has produced a person who is unacknowledged, alienated, and has nowhere to turn, whether through uh, sisterhood, husband, romantic interests, or various institutions. Edna has, in the next chapter, an encounter with the doctor. And they seem to be speaking at two different levels. They just sort of misunderstand or misrecognize one another. On page 1178, this is the doctor. The trouble is, sighed the doctor, grasping her meaning intuitively, that youth is given up to illusions. It seems to be a provision of nature, a decoy to secure mothers for the race. And nature takes no account of moral consequences, of arbitrary conditions which we create in which we feel obliged to maintain at any cost. What is the doctor saying? The doctor is saying you are acting like a little girl, that you, uh, that this is a, a problem of maturation, that you are immature, and that the dreams uh, of youth are really illusions, and that when you grow up, those things that you dreamt about are very different in the real adult world. Edna answers this, but answers this in a way that suggests, I think, a larger conversation about not just dreams of youth, but about modernity. Yes, she said, the years that are gone seem like dreams, if one might go on sleeping and dreaming, but to wake up and find, oh, well, perhaps it is better to wake up after all, even to suffer rather than to remain a dupe to illusions all one's life. So Edna is responding to this idea that youth uh, has uh, illusions or even delusions of what life should be like um, growing up and becoming an adult in, in an adult world. But I, I'd also th I also think that this addresses the conversation or a conversation about modernity, that as a child even, there are less responsibilities. You can play, you can make believe, you can do those sorts of things. You can enjoy life. There's that possibility. But in modernity, in society, people have responsibilities and those responsibilities are often very strict. For Edna, for instance, she had responsibilities to sit at her home every Tuesday and receive callers. I mean, is this a worthwhile, for some women, for some people, this would have been fine to socialize. It's certainly better than, than uh, social distancing that we have now, right? To have people come to your house and on other days you go visit other people and uh, you know probably you can shake hands and give hugs and things like that. That's not a bad thing, but it's not for everybody. 
And for Edna, she found that very constricting. And so this is really about, you know, I think some of the big questions about life. You know, what is the meaning of life? Is it purposeful? Am I getting satisfaction out of life? And these are questions that are not only asked in the great sort of sacred texts of the world, but also more directly uh, as it relates to this text, I think, the transcendentalism, particularly to a very famous passage that I'll read later from Henry David Thoreau. Okay, as we come in for a landing with this text, albeit it might be a crash landing in some ways, I'm on page 1181 as we are just about finished here. Second paragraph, the imagery of, of nature, of the water. The water of the gulf stretched out before her, gleaming with the million lights of the sun. The voice of the sea is seductive, never ceasing, whispering, clamoring, murmuring, inviting the soul to wander in abysses of solitude. All along the white beach, up and down, there was no living thing in sight. A bird with a broken wing was beating the air above, reeling, fluttering, circling disabled down, down to the water. Edna had found her old bathing suit still hanging, faded upon its accustomed peg. Um, okay, so, so far <clears throat> we have this, the imagery of the sea. Um, it's alluring to her, may re uh, represent freedom may represent mystery, uh, as I've uh, discussed earlier, that I think the symbol of the sea changes its meaning in various contexts of where it's placed in the story. The broken bird, I think, is symbolic of Edna, that she is broken, and the bird goes down into the water and presumably will die, uh, foreshadowing of what's going to happen here very shortly. She put it on, leaving her clothing in the bathhouse. But when she was there beside the sea, absolutely alone, she cast the unpleasant prickling garments from her. And for the first time in her life, she stood naked in the open air at the mercy of the sun, the breeze that beat upon her and the waves that invited her. So this is another image, I think, of birth or rebirth. The moment here is going to be short-lived, and then we'll ask questions as to why that might be the case. This is very freeing. The bathing suit, the style of bathing suit, the production that the bathing, the the method of production uh, of how the bathing suit was was created, uh, how the bathing suit would have been seen by uh, beachgoers, by her husband, her children, all of those things would have been outside of Edna's control. Here, with nobody there, she is her, quote-unquote, true self. Three paragraphs from the bottom of this page, 1181. She thought of Leonce and the children. They were part of her life, but they need not have thought that they could possess her body and soul. How Mademoiselle, how Mademoiselle Rees would have laughed, perhaps sneered if she knew. And you call yourself an artist. So we're at maybe a crossroad where Edna has now fully embraced her new self. And, and this is the sort of $64,000 question with this text. Has she, I guess, fully embraced herself? And if so, what is she doing with that information? Can she return to society as the new owner of her new self. Well, what happens here? She dies. She becomes tired as she swims further and further out. And then the last paragraph of this text, she looked into the distance and the old terror flamed up for an instant then sank again. Edna heard her father's voice and her sister Margaret's. She heard the barking of an old dog that was chained to the sycamore tree. The spurs of the cavalry officer clanged as he walked across the porch. There was the hum of bees and the musky odor of pinks filled the air. The 
past comes up again. And <clears throat> so if we think about if we think about Edna's death as um, I think it certainly could have been an accident, right? I mean, that's certainly a possibility. Um, there's also a very strong case here that Edna uh, went out uh, and committed suicide. I think that is certainly a possibility. The old terror flamed up for an instant. What is this old terror? Was it the old terror when she was learning how to swim and she thought she was going to drown? Possibly. But it's also the old terror of her past, because this is what in her last moments are invoked. Her father's voice and her sister. Is there any escape from one's past? The answer to that is no. There is no escape from one's past, but there's a process of understanding that past, uh, healing from the past, reconciling with the past. And that perhaps is something that Edna did not think she could overcome. This barking dog chained to a sycamore tree. Well, a moment ago, there's this bird with a broken wing, which I think is symbolic of Edna, and perhaps the old dog being chained to a tree is how Edna, a moment ago, or, or I should say the, the voice of her father and her sister is the past, and the old dog is Edna's future. And so, with those uh, as being possibilities here, with the future of being a prisoner, a continued prisoner, of being owned by other people, other forces and institutions that are not Edna's, perhaps this is what facilitated then her death. The cause, well, I mean, the cause for Edna's death is, is drowning. Um, the motivation, was it premeditated? Was it accidental? Again, this is the sort of $64,000 question with this text. Was it, or I should say, if Edna's death was a suicide, does this become the last act of a woman who takes complete ownership of her body, even if the, even if the decisions of ownership entail its destruction? And that is an argument that has also been made. Okay, so I have some um, some analysis. We've talked about a lot of different themes here. I've tried to codify many of them, list them. These are various topics of, uh, you know, areas of inquiry that uh, various arguments could be made. Uh, these are not, these categories are not exclusive of one another, and this is certainly not an exhaustive list. Uh, I have a couple of slides of this, and then I want to look a little bit closer at two, uh, a little bit, uh, closer, a little bit more in depth of two or three particular areas that we could venture into if we wanted, uh, you know, further inquiry. What is an awakening? What does it mean? Uh, again, questions that we can ask about this text that may form uh, your particular interpretation, something that you can argue for. We can look at men's roles in society. A uh, question, for instance, is, is Leon's uh, a good husband? Uh, relationship between men and uh, women and women, uh, social positions, uh, various uh, discrepancies, differences in business, doctors, uh, certainly with servants. And these are class distinctions. What we did not have an opportunity to spend time on are these class distinctions. For instance, how are servants treated? Do they have a voice? Uh, often, uh, or I think always, they are not white. They are Hispanic. They are dark skinned. Their silence in the text means what? These class distinctions are tied to race. Uh, is this text about reinforcing, reinforcing racial stereotypes, reinforcing bigotry? There is a story going on uh, about Edna and her awakening and her relationship with her husband, her children, and her society. There's also a relationship between that society and those people in that society with the other. And so there are many different, la uh, many different layers of the other in this text. I uh, just mentioned a few moments ago about suicide. We've talked about the past, the relationship between fathers and daughters, the, ro uh, the role and failure of social institutions, marriage, the church, the medical profession, and uh, certainly there are others that 
uh, could be a source of inquiry. Uh, music. Uh, music is, is a form of art. We've talked about art as a way to express oneself. Perhaps this is why Edna is interested in uh, becoming an artist to express herself. She responds to music. Uh, um, uh, Madame Ratignol and uh, Madame Ries are both musicians and she responds to both of them and their music in certain ways. So uh, an inquiry into music might be fruitful. Okay, so children are one of the areas of inquiry that we make, uh, that we might, uh, you know, further think about. Uh, in this text, children for the most part are seen and not really heard. Uh, they're brought in by the nursemaid. Uh, maybe Mr. Pontellier gives them candy. They interact with Edna and then they are uh, taken away. Uh, and uh, really they're raised by, uh, by servants. So children are seen and not heard. And what they really do, in, I think, in this text are a couple of things. One, they show the deficit, you know, this idea of what is a good mother. And they are the foil then that shows that Edna is not a good mother. In addition to that, the children represent uh, something that Edna is supposed to excise from herself the dreams of her past, the illusions, uh, the things that she felt as a younger girl, as a child, which are causing her difficulty as an adult because she has not let go. What I have here are uh, some various quotes um, from some thinkers. Two of them here are uh, transcendentalists. Um, and let me, let me read uh, some of these quotes. Uh, this is from Henry David Thoreau. Children who play life discern its true law and relations more clearly than men, who fail to live it worthily, but who think that they are wiser by experience. That is, by failure. What Thoreau here is talking about is that there's a sense that as we get older and we have experience, that we are to leave those dreams behind because that's not real anymore. And Thoreau says, Actually, that playtime and that curiosity, you were more alive then, more satisfied with your life than you are now as an adult. Okay, so again, these are, these are ways with which we can think of trying to recover the importance of childhood, which this text is, uh, I think, constructing or, or denouncing uh, in a very pejorative way uh, what being a child is. William Wordsworth, uh, William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge in 1798 published Lyrical Ballads, the unofficial beginning of uh, Romanticism. And William Wordsworth here says, the child is father of the man. What was William Wordsworth referring to? I think in a similar fashion to the transcendentalists uh, here, Thoreau, that for Wordsworth, you know, there's a, there's a connection that we need to recover with nature. We don't just look at nature as something that is beautiful, but something that, uh, in part, people also help create, that, the, that there's an important ingredient, and that ingredient is you or the subject, helps create the beauty of nature. And what's important in that is children that children have a connection to nature that often as adults we no longer have because we are uh, busy at work. We're watching videos on YouTube about the analysis of Kate Chopin's The Awakening. We have things that we have to do. We have to play 10 hours of Call of Duty and then we have to binge watch Stranger Things. We have all sorts of different things that we have to do. But do we go out for a walk? Do we chase butterflies? I don't know if we do anymore. And w William Wordsworth thought, you know, lines written above, uh, Ryan, uh, excuse me, lines composed above Tintern Abbey, that we no longer did those sorts of things. So the child could teach the adult. Jean-Jacques Rousseau's Emile, an important early romantic text, predates lyrical ballads, published in the middle of the 18th century. This was a pioneering text, if you will, uh, spoke about the importance of childhood, also spoke about the importance of being a mother and things like breastfeeding, which had never really been written about before. 
Uh, quote from uh, Rousseau, we can never put ourselves in the shoes of children. We cannot fathom their thoughts. We lend them ours. And always following our own reasoning, we stuff their heads with extravagance and error. And so this is uh, Rousseau thinking about us being the adult, trying to imprint our, uh, to go back to Thoreau's quote, experience upon or knowledge upon the child. And uh, we shouldn't be doing that. We're making an error doing so, that children and their dreams and their curiosity should be left intact. Uh, another quote from Emil, the training of children is a profession where we must know how to waste time in order to save it. And from Emerson, uh, which is uh, directly alluded to uh, or directly mentioned in the text, this is from his famous essay, Self-Reliance. He's talking about conformity and non-conformity. And this, this is an argument, um, uh, and I'm going to touch on, uh, on this in a moment. Uh, this is an argument that Edna is being nonconformist, and this is the source of her pain because she is a woman in this society who has certain expectations. But in terms of children, Emerson says, infancy conforms to nobody, all conform to it, so that one babe commonly makes four or five out of the adults who prattle and play to it. So here, what Emerson is saying, um, that in terms of conformity, as we become adults, we conform to what everybody else does. Uh, we, you know, we go to school and we do this and we drink coffee and we go to Starbucks and we go to Dunkin' Donuts or whatever it's called. And we do the things that adults do. And the things that adults do are sort of all the same. But a child is a nonconformist and can even change the behavior of adults. And so this, I think, is, this, is one of the meta narratives in this text. Children should be seen and not heard, and yet children play a significant role, which, is, uh, which shows up here as a deficit, both in the society at large and in the struggles that Edna is experiencing. Okay, next area of uh, more serious uh, inquiry. Sexual and gender identity, women's roles in society. Um, this text, uh, in a very sort of classical sense, uh, is an early feminist text speaking about how Edna is trying to repossess herself and gain her own voice. What I've, what I've done here from a variety of different sources, this is impossible to do uh, in a very short list. There's been multiple waves of feminist theory. It's impossible to sort of do what I'm doing in a very successful way, but I just want to sort of give us an, an idea of how a particular lens or a particular theory uh, can be applied to a literary text. And so I have sort of six characteristics, very, very general characteristics of sexual and gender identity. And then we'll, you know, uh, my next slide has a series of questions on how that might be applied to the awakening. One, women are oppressed by patriarchy, economically, politically, socially, and psychologically. Two, where patriarchy reigns, woman is the other. She is marginalized, defined only by her difference from male norms and values. Three, all of Western civilization is deeply rooted in patriarchal ideology, i.e. Eve is the uh, origin of sin and death, referring to uh, uh, Eve in the story uh, in, in the book of Genesis in, in the Hebrew Bible. Four, while biology determines sex, male or female, or variations, culture determines gender, masculine or feminine, or variations. All feminist activity, including feminist theory and literary criticism, has as its ultimate goal to change the world by prompting a conversation about gender equality. Gender issues play a part of every aspect of human production and experience, whether we are consciously aware of them or not. Okay, and how might we use feminist theory in application to a literary text? And here I have a series of questions that are different avenues of, of possible further inquiry. How is the relationship between men and women portrayed? And so you would maybe apply these questions to 
uh, Kate Chopin's The Awakening or to any other literary text. Again, the, the, the six characteristics that I laid out for you in basic feminist theory, very, very, very basic. It's a much, much broader uh, body of work. So how is the relationship between men and women portrayed? How might women's roles be determined by social institutions? And I think you're gonna see some of my analysis over the last couple of hours fall into or address a conversation towards any of these questions, uh, towards some of these questions. What is the role of, of objectification and or sexual objectification as a cultural or individual project of embedding women's identity subjacent to patriarchal concerns, ideology, or domination? Do women own their own bodies or their own sexual desires and how is that received? How are men's and women's roles defined? Are there consequences for transcending gender boundaries? What does the work imply about sisterhood and how might it function to reinforce or mitigate gender role subjectivity or independence? What does the work say about women and creativity and production? What does the history of the work's reception to the public and by the critics tell about um, you know, the operation of patriarchy? And these are sort of larger uh, considerations. What role does the work play in terms of women's literary history and the literary tradition? So in the first group, the first uh, sort of six tenets or characteristics of basic feminist theory, and this is how that uh, very short, very summarized body of knowledge, how we might apply it to a literary text. And so again, these are questions that can be applied to this text that uh, might further your understanding, our understanding, uh, our interpretation to argue for a particular viewpoint. And then finally, to circle back around to transcendentalism and uh, the question of of, of Edna's purpose uh, is not just, I, I think we can, it's certainly a discussion of patriarchy and institution and those sorts of things, but I think it also asks larger questions about modernity. Does modernity give people purpose in life? Can we exist and be happy? If we, if we can't go to the woods for two years, two months, and two days like Thoreau did. We can't go out and smell the roses or ponder a thousand acres or seize the day. That I think, those things I think are in opposition to, you get up in the morning, you go to work, you do your schoolwork, you come home, you do more work, you pay your bills, you know, over and over and over again. And I think that is also, uh, a fruitful area of inquiry. So I want to wrap up the discussion with two quotes, um, again, from Henry David Thoreau and Rolf Waldo Emerson uh, towards this end, that I think in many ways, Kate Chopin's The Awakening is a transcendentalist text uh, from Emerson's self-reliance. To believe your own thought, to believe that what is true for you and your private heart is true for all men, that is genius. To speak your latent conviction, and it shall be the universal sense, for the inmost in due time becomes the outmost, and our first thought is rendered back to us by the trumpets of the last judgment. Is this easy to recognize? No. Is this a process that's easy to embrace? Absolutely not. Is it easier for a man to do than a woman to do? Absolutely it is. People like Arobin and Robert in this text, they are unmarried, they are unchained, if you will. They can do what they want. They can go where they want to go. They don't have the, the kinds of limitations or responsibilities that other people uh, have, in, including the, the limitations that Edna has. So for Edna to First, the awakening of believing her own thoughts. That's the first part of it. Then the second part is the process on acting upon it. And perhaps Edna, as a woman, did not have either the faculties or the, the courage that was talked about, or she just recognized the impossibility of finding her happiness as being a self-reliant person in this society. And then we have the tragic outcome. And this is about... You know, again, the quality of life, 
what is the purpose? And again, to bring in a very uh, famous, uh, this is a very famous quote by Henry David Thoreau. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. I did not wish to live what was not life. Living is so dear. Nor did I wish to practice resignation unless it was quite necessary. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life, to live so sturdily and Spartan-like as to put to rout all that was not life, to cut a broad swath and shave close, to drive life into a corner and reduce it to its lowest terms. And I think in part, this is what Edna is struggling with, purpose and quality. And in this quote by uh, Thoreau, to drive life into a corner, to use that as a metaphor, perhaps Edna felt herself driven into a corner and it was a corner that she could not escape. Okay, that wraps up my discussion of Kate Chopin's The Awakening. Um, we went through the text uh, fairly uh, exhaustively. I mean, there's it's a long text. There's uh, a lot of beautiful passages. Uh, if I was in class with my students, we would have spent more time because not only would I have been reading the passages that I've been reading for this presentation, but uh, a number of passages just because I found them so beautiful. I, every time I read this text, I am a bigger fan uh, of the awakening. Thank you.